Hello and welcome to another Chai Cheetahs video. In today's video, we're going to be unpacking some of the key characters in The Handmaid's Tale, looking at some descriptions of them, but also some important quotes to include in your literary essays. So remember to go watch the videos on the skills required to write a literature essay, as well as the video, the short video I did a few weeks back about um, how to integrate quotes into your literature essays, because that will be helpful as a premise to this content. So our first character is obviously Offred. She's our protagonist. We are hearing the story from her perspective, so she's the first person narrator. I obviously cannot go through everything in one video, so I'm just going to try and do the highlights of each character, especially Offred, there's so much to say about her. Um, the dystopian events unfold through her eyes. She tells her story using numerous flashbacks and by directly addressing the reader. Um, and so this creates suspense, but it also creates a sort of fractured reality, um, what emphasizes the fractured reality that Alfred experiences. Um, she is seemingly passive, but I would argue that she's quite resistant in her thoughts. And the big thing with Alfred is the question of whether she is a resistor or whether she is an enabler of the society, whether she just gives in. And you can obviously argue either way, because that's the beauty of English, in that you can argue um, in whichever direction you choose, as long as you have substantiation, and you have substantiation for both. Um, but I would certainly argue, while she seems to give in to the society, um, you know, through her relationship with the commander, through not openly, or as we would expect, openly resisting, and we're going to discuss open resistance with Offred when we get to her, but she is extremely resistant in her mind because she's supposed to be indoctrinated in her mind, but she does not lose sight of her sanity. Unlike, you know, Janine who loses her sanity and completely gives in to the to the society's demands. So I definitely would argue that she is resistant in her thoughts. She thinks things against this um, dystopian world. And she also keeps her memories close to heart. She doesn't forget about her loved ones in her past life. She still keeps that connection with her with her old life. And that's a form of resistance in this really hectic society. She is obviously the handmaid for Commander Fred and his wife, um, Serena Joy. She's haunted by her past. Her memories and her love keep her from losing her sanity. She has secret meetings with the commander where they play Scrabble and talk. She values his companionship to an extent. She has a strong attraction to Nick and sleeps with him at Serena's request. She has a somewhat ambiguous ending. It's suggested that she's taken away, taken from the commander's house by the resistance, but it appears that the, it's the members of the Eyes who take her away. So the thing with this novel is that there's a lot of ambiguity to it and a lot of, you know, not everything is clear cut. And so we have to come to terms with that and understand the ambiguity in its own right. So some important quotes relating to Offred, worthy vessel, that's obviously related to her role as a handmaid. And something really significant about this novel is you see all the different characters and in this dystopian world, this dystopian society, they are all... Um, seen for just one aspect of their humanity because that's what dystopia does dystopia takes this idealistic framework and it corrupts it in some way and what you're left with is a loss of humanity and we'll discuss this more in the themes video but just something to remember that each of these characters you'll see like there's only one thing that's important by the society one thing that's valued and the rest of their humanity is is not valued is sort of criticized or put aside or ignored the amount of unfilled time, the long parentheses of nothing, that's talking about all the, all the boredom she has as this handmaid, she's not allowed to do anything. Holding out her arms to me being carried away, and this is her haunting past where her and Luke and their daughter try to escape. I would like to steal something from this room, it would make me feel power, make me feel that I have power. I want to be valued in ways that I am not. I want to be more than valuable. I repeat my former name, remind myself of what I could do once, how others saw me. I believe in the resistance as I believe there can be no light without shadow, or rather no shadow unless there's also light. And that's really significant, and we'll talk about it more when we get to, um, to themes, but this idea of no matter how restrictive a society is, there is still going to be a, um, a form of resistance. There will still always be that light. There will still always be a glimmer of hope. 
What I coveted with the sh was the wu, where the she is. I didn't want to live my life on her terms. I envy the command in his pen. It's one more thing I would like to steal. So this this desire to steal something is this desire to have some sort of power or even just to be seen because as a handmaid she's really not seen or noticed and so i step up into the darkness darkness within or else the light so there's that ambiguity again between is it darkness is it light is she being taken by the resistance or by the eyes i wish the story were different i wish it were more civilized i wish it showed me in a better light if not happier then at least more active less hesitant less distracted by trivia that's a really important quote and for those of you who have read the great gatsby you'll know the whole dilemma about the first person narrator and whether this narrator is reliable or not we are obviously hearing this and we have a framework for it in terms of there's a framing device that this is a um these are a series of tapes that we are listening to um that offer it has recorded we don't know exactly when she recorded we're assuming it's afterwards so that maybe would give us an understanding that maybe it wasn't such a bad ending after all but we really there's a lot of you know unknowns regarding the narration but this sort of quote tells us that this is a clearly you know it's a it's a catalog story or it's been i've lost the word now i found the word it's been curated for our ears so as much as we want to believe everything opera does we also have to be understanding this is a first person narration and we know ourselves like when we tell a story we can often tell it and it is um you know we embellish it in some way and so this quote can do two things it can either show us okay the story may be flawed it maybe didn't happen exactly like this you know maybe it's just interpretation or it could actually indicate to us this is actually quite truthful because she's being truthful and she's saying i wish i actually had done something more i wish i didn't present me in this light so it's a bit of a tangent i don't think that asks such a such a complicated question uh, but Offred is a really fundamental character and just like the tempest where i said that you know it's difficult to you know all these different characters it's difficult to write whole paragraphs on them i would definitely recommend that you look at each of these characters in relation to Offred. so you can have a paragraph on Offred, and then you can have a paragraph on like Offred and commander fred Offred and moira etc so commander fred he's an important and powerful man gilead he's married to serena joy he conducts secret meetings with Offred under the claim to make her life more bearable um, and he gifts her with illegal materials and here are some nice quotes he has something we don't have he has the word i'd like you to play scrabble with me if anyone asks tell them you're an evening rental so he's a really interesting character um, and i think his whole relationship with offred is up for debate up for discussion you can go either way and say either you know he was being honest and truthful and he just wanted to help her or he was you know had some ulterior motive and he was exercising his power What's important is this quote, if anyone asks, tell them you're an evening rental, and this is when he takes offer to Jezebel's. And it's significant because you see that this theme of resistance, and even the society who's supposed, well, the people who the society is supposed to be serving, like Commander Fred and Serena Joy, they both do things that go against the society. But the thing is, they're not gonna pay the repercussions. They're not gonna have to pay for the consequences of this resistance that they do, or that they, enact and who is on the chopping block offer on the chopping block these lower class people are on the chopping block for their actions against the government that's supposed to be serving them i hope that makes sense the next one is serena joy she's a former television star she's married to the commander she busies herself with hobbies such as crafts and gardening and she's quite condescending towards offer and the nice quote is she was a malicious and vengeful woman now she's a really interesting character because she acts as a foil to offer it and as much as she is terribly mean and condescending to offer it you also have to understand that she was once this person she had a life just like offer it she had a completely different life before the regime took over and she was this vital lively television star and now she's the sort of shell of her former self because she's unable to have a child or she's been told she's unable to have a child and that is um significantly you know it's it's very very much um you know demotivates her or it takes away a key aspect of her confidence because women in the society are deemed valuable by their ability to have children 
Um, and so just understanding Serena, you can obviously understand her in a very um, negative way, but you can also understand if you're going to be a little bit more sympathetic towards her. But importantly is that there's a transformation in that character as well, what she was before the regime took over and what she is now. Moira, such an important character. I would definitely try and write a paragraph with Moira and offer it together because I think she is such a, she's a form of inspiration for Alfred, um, but she also is a foil to her because we see her, she's definitely an, an um, embodiment of resistance. Alfred's outspoken college friend, a fierce feminist and a resistor of the new wave of Gilead. She escapes from the Rachel and Leah Center and ends up working as a prostitute with Jezebel's. Alfred is saddened by her story, as Moira seems to have accepted her enchantment and has not continued to openly strive for liberty. She is definitely a realist. And that ending where, you know, Alfred turns back and says, I never saw her again, and she's very upset by Moira's loss of any sort of um, striving for, for her freedom again, is really quite depressing, and it really shows the effect of the regime and on society, how it can crush people. Um, what's important with Moira as well is this is a character that Alfred know, knows before the regime takes over and also after. So it's really, you can see the changing in their relationship, you can see, you can, it mirrors the times. Friendships were suspicious, had a mechanical ability, she used to fix her own car, the minor things. Moira had a bad reputation, she is a cunning and dangerous woman. Uh, Moira had power now. She'd been set loose. She'd set herself loose. Moira was like an elevator with open sides. She made us dizzy. Already we were losing the taste for freedom. Already we were finding these walls secure. That's such a good quote. That's when she escapes from the Red Center and um, Alfred remarks about like all these girls, all these future handmaids looking at her like they had already started just to accept their lives and what they were going to be. And Moira is someone who refuses to do that. I don't know how she ended, or even if she did, because I never saw her again. Alright, off Glenn. Now, off Glenn is Alfred's shopping partner. She's part of the Mayday Resistance. She kills herself to avoid capture, um, and she sort of acts as his companion to Alfred, and she's almost replaceable because, like, a few days later, there's a new off Glenn. What's important about Afghan is to understand the resistance because I think we're very judgmental of Offred and you know like what did she really do yeah what resistance did she actually form a part of but her talks with Afghan and when they're by soul scrolls and they're talking I mean it seems very trivial but really this is a big form of resistance this is something exceptional exceptionally brave and courageous um, to do it's very dangerous to even having to even have these conversations. And so Afghan is also another form of like inspiration for Alfred in not just accepting the status quo and not just accepting what's expected, but trying to live within the society to protect yourself for survival, but also looking beyond. The Marthas are the dutiful servants of the noble families. Remember, everyone in the society has their place. If they don't have a place, they're sent elsewhere. And then you have Alfred's mother, who is sent to the colonies. She is an outspoken feminist. Remember, this novel was written in nineteen in the nineteen eighties. So Alfred's mother is a is a you know a radical outspoken feminist from the sixties and seventies, where the second wave of feminism was um, you know was taking over the world. Um, she she sent to the colonies after change of power, and this is the difference. I think cause there's a lot of similarities between Moira and Alfred's mother in terms of them both being sort of feminists and radical and you know just outspoken independent women um moira still has the ability to have children she's young so she's taken to be trained as a handmaid but Alfred's mother she is well she's lost her that one aspect of her use in inverted commas and so she's sent to the colonies they don't want to um deal with her obviously all of her thoughts um and her um her political and radicalized nature. Well, I don't know if it's radical, but I think it's radical in this society, obviously, to have women have any sorts of rights whatsoever. Um, and so she's sent to the colonies. And she has a lot of nice quotes. One of them are, they aren't a patch on women except they're better at fixing cars and playing football, just what we need for the improvement of the human race, right? And then here we have um, this, when Moira, when Moira and Offred meet up again at Jezebel's, Moira says, 
that Alfred's mother landed up in the colonies. And Alfred's relationship with her mother is another one of those things that's sort of ambiguous. Um, you know, we don't know the full story. It's almost like her relationship with Luke, we, we like conflicted as to, you know, or she's conflicted about it. But it is ultimately her mother. And she cares for her deeply. And she says, I think of my mother sweeping up deadly toxins. I can't quite believe it. Surely her cockiness, her optimism and energy, her pizzazz will get her out of this. She will think of something. So you do see that Alfred does appreciate her mother. She looks up to her. She's also a form of inspiration for her. You know, she is someone like Moira who just manages to be independent and get things done. And I think Alfred herself, maybe before the, the takeover as well, she's not as independent or confident as Alfred's, as her mother and as Moira, but she has to sort of grow into that aspect of herself. That's just an opinion, though. Nick, he works as a giant and a gardener for Commander Fred and Serena Joy, and he's Alfred's love interest. And from the beginning, one of the very first descriptions of him, his cap is tilted at a jaunty angle. Now, that may seem very trivial, but it's really important in the society where you have to conform. And any sort of little thing that you do that's out of place is the cause for great concern. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of foreshadowing that they, he's going to break the rules in some way. And... Um, yeah, Alfred is, is taken by him and he's taken by Alfred. Luke, so Alfred's husband before handmaid dates, he cheated on his first wife with Alfred. Um, he's the father of Alfred's daughter. Luke and their daughter haunt Alfred's thoughts. Alfred is unsure about what happens to him, whether he was killed, captured or managed to escape because remember, they tried to escape um, once the takeover occurred. We have a very ambiguous feeling towards Luke, very conflicted and ambivalent because he is seen to, you know, he had an affair, and sometimes the quotes like this one um, about patronizing Alfred seem like this is a, a, you know, not the greatest guy. But at the same time, there is a lot of love between him and Alfred, and Alfred thinks about him often, and she really, and how she stays sane is, is trying to think of him and the life that they had and their daughter. So definitely, I wouldn't argue it's all negative at all. Um, I think it's definitely um, positive and this relationship keeps her going. This quote comes when they take away the wo um, women's rights to have a bank account and she's like worried and he's like don't worry like, you know, I'll just pay for everything um, and she's like already he's starting to patronize me then I thought already he's starting to get paranoid so that's just the beginning of the end almost the beginning of the end of life as they knew it. So next up we have Aunt Lydia and Aunt Elizabeth. They are the ladies in charge of the Rachel and Leah Center. They undertake their roles of re-education extremely seriously. Aunt Lydia is the one who has most of the quotes. Um, Aunt Elizabeth is obviously a part of the whole system, um, but Aunt Lydia seems to be the main player. They utilize violence and brutality. They have absolute and utter control over the women at the center. They teach a distorted version of Christianity. Alfred shares their disturbing teaching epigrams throughout the novel's flashbacks, so she recalls what they say, how they try to re-educate these women and what Alfred, what she thinks she's supposed to believe or what she knows she's supposed to believe in this society. Aunt Lydia leads the salvaging and Moira escapes in Aunt Elizabeth's clothes after disarming her. So this is a really, you know, these characters are really pivotal because you've turned women on women. So these are women who are teaching other women to sort of degrade themselves or not to degrade themselves, but dehumanizing these women and making them only about their childbearing qualities and disregarding everything else about them. So it's really pertinent and really quite depressing, in my opinion. Why expect one woman to carry out all the functions necessary to the serene running of a household? It isn't reasonable or humane. Your daughters will have greater freedom. I just noticed the typo there with carry. It's a double R. Um, and they've just, these, um, you know, maybe it's not on Lydia and Aunt Elizabeth. Maybe they've been indoctrinated themselves. But they teach this belief that this is good for these women. That these women should be living this life according to is sort of the handmaid's guide or how um, the society has deemed it appropriate for them to lead their lives by just focusing on childbearing that it's more honorable it's a way for them to sort of atone what we're aiming for says Aunt Lydia is a spirit of camaraderie amongst women we must all pull together so it's really deep 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 indoctrination and it's very much about 
the role of women being different to the role of men, which if you think back in history, that's how it was. And in our current times, we're trying to shift that. And then in this dystopian reality, we go back to that idea of men and women being very, very much different. Janine Offeren, a woman who attended the same training as Offeren at the Rachel Mia Center. She has a child as a handmaid, but it's revealed that the baby was not fathered by a commander. So that's obviously quite disgraceful. And she loses her sanity. So I always think of Offred as a resistor in terms of Janine or in terms of Offred because Offred keeps her sanity, which is really important. And it's her way of resisting their regime and the ideas that they are making her follow. Whereas you see the dangers of what, um, you know, the Red Shemir Center can do to someone. It can really degrade them and take away their humanity and their sanity. And lastly, we have the professor at the end who is going through these tapes and who is analyzing it. So he analyzes and interprets the tape, interprets the tapes of Offred's story in the future. He studies Offred's story as a true historical narrative um, and he implores for Offred's tale to be understood rather than judged. So quite interestingly, this sort of approach to understanding Offred's story is quite similar to how historians today study, you know, pieces of literature from other time periods trying not to impart or embellish or see through the lens of modern society but rather assess the historical narrative as it was in that time um, so i mean you can talk forever about this whole framing device within a framing device of how what what comment does that make on our society in the sense that we don't put our own moral values onto history um, so it's a whole other thing that could be unpacked, which I'm not going to do right now because I don't think it will be tested in that much detail. We must be cautious about passing moral judgment upon the Gilead, and surely we have learned by now that such judgments are of necessity cultural specific, culture specific. Our job is not to censure, but to understand. I hope that that video has been helpful. It's just the tip of the iceberg, just a brief recap of all these different characters and some important quotes for you to use. Please make sure to like the video and to subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in the next video.